Good day, everybody, and welcome to the House of Mario, the South Australian Nintendo podcast that is backed by 120 Power Star rating. I'm your host, Drew Agnews, and the doors to this episode are open. This week on the show, we're talking to John O'Peck, his host of Putting in Work. He's a published author and he's narrative designer, lead writer, and sound designer of Trigger Witch. Jono, how you going? Fantastic, Drew. Thanks for having me on the show. So uh, I guess it's like my third or fourth appearance in the world of the House of Mario. So it's good to be back after after a few, after a couple of years at least. Yeah. Yeah, you've always got a reason to come in. You always weasel your way into the show, and I appreciate <laughs> that. Always love an excuse to yeah. talk to you, Jono. Sounds good. But yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, and you're here to talk all about your new game you've been writing, Trigger Witch, with Rain Bite. Um, and I've got to say off the bat, I'm really excited about this. Um, I've cu- it was a couple of days ago, I finished the game, really, really enjoyed it. And I'm glad I can say that, otherwise this will be a really awkward podcast. <laughs> I'll be like, you know what, John, I yeah. didn't, didn't really enjoy it that much, but we'll talk about it anyway. But thankfully, that is not the case. Absolutely Here's fantastic all game. <laughs> yeah. Here's all my problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like... You know, as a, as someone who's done this podcast for the last four years or so, and you're sort of just learning as you're going along, it's easy when you're talking about a Nintendo game, you can say all the things you don't like. You're talking about another big publisher, all the things you don't like. But when it comes to, say, a small indie game, when you're at PAX and the guy is literally watching you play the game, he's like, what do you think? Yeah. And you're like, oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's a bit rough. Yeah, uh, it is. You, you're almost like... It's, it's funny because they really want your honest feedback so that they can tweak the game. But, but yeah. everyone's just like, it's good. Yeah, oh, so good. So good. Uh, yeah, I don't know about this bit, but I won't say that. <laughs> yeah. I remember playing a game at PAX a few years ago and the guy was like, what do you think of the music? And I was like, in my head, I was, I was thinking, didn't notice it. Can't remember what it was. But I just said, yeah, it was good. <laughs> didn't want to hurt his feelings. Yeah, especially at PAX when it's like on a show floor where you can't necessarily even hear it little yeah <laughs> it's it's not the same but anyway <laughs> good on mm. them so Jono, what is trigger witch what is your sort of marketing um <laughs> description Elevator of the game <laughs> yeah what what's the uh, yeah. your pitch for it it's zelda with guns that's the easiest way Hell to put yeah. it uh <laughs> it's a twin stick shooter it's open world it's pixel art graphics and it's a lot of fun and it's very bloody too. It's like a Tarant- It's like if Quentin Tarantino made a pixel art Zelda game. Yeah, no, definitely. That is how I'd describe it too. Like, imagine Link to the Past, but instead of getting around with a sword, you're a, you're a witch, and it's a twin stick shooter, and you're just just mowing down these poor enemies. I don't know what they necessarily did to deserve it, but man, they hey, cop it. Gotta- they cop it a lot. They're just uh, they're, they're messing with you. You know, they they mm. drew first blood. Yeah, true, true. They they go after you. Actually, when you get to like each tile of the game, I notice like it's it's still until you make the first move, then they're on to you. So yeah. really, you are the bad guy. You're making the first move. That's right. You're stepping into their territory. Mm. Just taking but, down uh, the wildlife. Don't feel too bad about it. <laughs> no, no. I, I'm only thinking about it now as I'm talking about it. What, what, did, <laughs> what did that poor little brown blob there actually do to me? Apart from... Mm. Apart from probably kill yeah. me a couple of it's times. It's all um it's all like in the lore, actually, like the reasons for all these little creatures. So it's it's good fun having that tucked in the back of my brain mm. as I play. <laughs> yeah, like the the um moment at the start where you can get all the lore um in the church. Well, yeah. Yeah. The chamber. Yes. Sorry, I <laughs> <laughs> don't have the terminology down. Yes, the chamber. The Everything's ch- named after guns in this in this world. It's the chamber. Mm. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. I never actually thought of it that way. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, all the all the characters are named after guns. All the witches are named after either gun brands or parts of the guns. You know, you've got Remy, Shelley. You know, uh, <laughs> Colette is like a cult. You know, Hilda. It's like the hilt. We had some other names that that ended up as, as like NPCs, Loretta and Winch and they're all, yeah, they're all named after guns just to kind of, um, I don't know if that's something people will pick up on, but it was fun for us trying to come up with those different mm. names. 
I've got to be honest, I didn't pick up on that. I know I'm not the uh, yeah. the man to ask because I'm probably <laughs> too stupid. <laughs> But yeah, I didn't even pick up on Shelley. I didn't. I just thought of Shelley as you know, you <laughs> like a typical normal name. But yeah. now, now when, you pointed when you out play then, through the physical edition in a, in a couple of months, then you'll you'll notice all that, all that stuff. So so laid out in the uh, art book and stuff. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen it. But you'll mm. if you play the game again, you'll notice all the names this time. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I'll I'll go into it with some a uh, little bit more context. <laughs> Um, so before we, uh, sort of dive into the, the, uh, I guess the, the backstory of how you got into writing this particular game, uh, what was some of your sort of writing career history? We know you're a author, you've published two books, uh, you used to write for, um, your local newspaper. Um, so what was the sort of career path to getting into this, um, and what made you want yeah. to stretch your legs into game writing? Well, the the writing was just always something that's been what I've what I've had in the back pocket. It's the skill that I had in high school that I thought would be the one that translated to a career. So that naturally led me into journalism and then into uh, public relations. Now, and uh, I guess the books were were my first foray into that creative writing and fiction and even like through the process of writing those as much as I've enjoyed it it was a challenge and I, I got those published and, and that's like a, a huge bucket list thing I don't I'm not like a massive fiction consumer of, of, of books like novels mm. so it was always kind of like I was impersonating an author in that sense um, but writing a game really is feeling like I've, I've hit like my spot because big like big gamer always loved games always loved games with story there's like that the tweet getting around recently like name five games that made you the gamer who you are today and all the ones that i was picking were mm. ones with these narratives that I, I still love and remember whether it's like metal gear solid final fantasy 7 secret of monkey island like there's just a lot of either dialogue or text so i guess that's always been in the back of the mind and I always uh, you know after writing the books thought that I'd love to write a video game and having some friends who were indie devs in Rainbite was the opportunity where I just offered to to edit their next game after being a fan of Reverie and knowing that none of them came from like a writing background all three of them being programmers not that there were, were any like typos in Reverie or anything <laughs> that I can remember but yeah just offering to do some editing of the dialogue and the script and they said, do you want to write the game? And I said, absolutely. So that's how that came about. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, just with like Reverie, I thought it was just a really awesome game as well. And it's a, it's kind of a trigger, which is a bit of like an expansion on that idea, like with a, a couple more dungeons and um, its own sort of spin on what that mm-hmm. sort of Zelda formula can be. Whereas Reverie was more of your, you know, your, your typical... Uh, take on what uh, that type of open world Zelda game would be. So, yeah. I'd- yeah, Reverie was was like, it was basically Zelda with a reskin in, in some senses because like you can even go back and look at like this item in Zelda becomes this item in Reverie and mm. that kind of thing. So I think with Trigger Witch, they were really pushing the genre a lot more and it's, it's more like it's taken inspiration from, I guess, the the style of Zelda what, way more than like the actual gameplay. There's not really that much gameplay that's, that's coming over from that style of, um, you know, NES or super NES game. It's, mm. it's very much a modern twin stick shooter in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess with the super Nintendo didn't have a second stick, so <laughs> I guess they couldn't. Have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but with, with you saying that you offered to, uh, to, um, you know, test the uh, the game, and then they asking you that can you please write it? Um, did you have sort of much uh, contact with the the guys before that, being like you know playing games online or just anything mm. like that, or was it sort of out of the blue? Just hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the um, I had Butler, Tom Butler, and Jared on putting in work mm-hmm. uh, in twenty. 
2017 or whenever Reverie came out. And from there, I guess Jared and I followed each other on, on Twitter and we slowly started to play games together. We played through like most of Division 2 together, which is probably like the game we've played the most. And it got to the point where we would just like jump into a party chat and talk when we're playing games late at night, even if we weren't necessarily playing the same game. So we were, we were hitting it off pretty well as, as mates and um, I got to catch up with both of those guys when I was in New Zealand visiting um, our friend Tom Marshall as well. And so, yeah, there's definitely the friendship there. And I think it was after that, the timeline's a bit foggy in my brain with everything that's happened since then. But yeah, it was after that that they said, hey, do you want to come in as, I guess, a contractor to, to work on the story? And it just grew from there. I think originally they thought that it would be slightly more dialogue than Reverie, and it's turned out to be like fifty times more probably, mm. um, because I went <laughs> I went way overboard <laughs> in a good way, and um, really just fleshed out this great concept that they had. Um, you know, they came up with the the idea of the game, the the main main characters, and the big twist that happens in the game, and I just took it from there and tried to make it work and make sense. Yeah, and just when I started the game and I saw that there's like dialogue choices. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> John has been busy. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, <laughs> and, and that was that was um something that I, I did really get to um have a bit of influence over, like coming up with ideas like that. For example, like there's some cut scenes that are quite long, and I was like, uh, I'm, I'm a bit nervous that people are going to like skip through all this text. So how do I get them to pay more attention? I'll make some dialogue options, and that way they feel like they have a bit more to do. And at the same time, you get that benefit of feeling like you can kind of uh, pick what type of approach your Colette is going to have to the other characters in the world. Hmm. Yeah, because were there any sort of inspirations you're looking at when you're writing this game of how to draw the player's attention, keep them interested in more cut scenes and while the story is unfolding? Nothing specific with that particularly it was more like just like from my experience as a gamer and as someone that's you know played a lot of games and written every type of document that you possibly could from an annual report to a social media post to a news article to a, a book i know that like brevity is very underrated and mm. if you can say something in one line Instead of two, that's always going to be better. Um, so it, it's, it was about finding that balance between giving enough information to be interesting and to be saying something versus not wanting to feel like you're wasting anyone's time. So that's, that's always the challenge with games and you know, gameplay is always a click away. So people are always kind of wanting to get to that. And it's something I've noticed like watching all the Xbox demos is people like some people just want to get straight to the get, where's the gun give me the gun mm -hmm. and then other people are like reading the dialogue out loud and they're enjoying every single part of it along the way so you have to kind of cater to both of those groups i think and, and that's one of the, the challenges for sure when you'd like checking out the xbox demo because the uh, demo came uh first to xbox before it came anywhere else uh, mm -hmm. So you went you went around, had a look at the Let's Play, see how people were interacting with the game, how they were finding the dialogue and the gameplay and just everything everything to do with it. I can imagine that could be hard in some cases where someone's like, oh, shut up, I don't care, just like <laughs> mushing the A Pretty button much. to get through it. Yeah, yeah, and then they're like confused about <laughs> how, to re how to reload or something and it's like, dude, you just skipped the tutorial, what do you expect? <laughs> and like I know we've all been there before yeah, yeah. playing games so you can't hold it against the two especially because it's a demo and they're like not super invested and they're just trying to see what the game's like so yeah I'm not gonna hold that against them but if you if you do that when the game's out and you're streaming it I'm gonna be in the chat and I'm gonna be telling you hey <laughs> shouldn't have skipped that dialogue buddy <laughs> <laughs> yeah because yeah I can imagine whenever you play a game now, you'll be like, all right, I'm going to read this text very closely. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I've just played a game that's got a ton of text. And by the end of the game, I was mashing through it because <laughs> it's got way too much. And it's, that's the thing that I'm saying. Like you have to respect the player's time. You have to think about 
you know, is this really necessary? Uh, I guess it depends on the type of game it is, mm. especially when there's no voice acting. Like that's even a, it's even a, an even tougher sell to get people's attention because they're like, oh, I don't want to read a book. If I wanted to read a book, I'd be reading a book. So yeah, it's um, and I, I think one of the things that helps is that the game at least attempts to be pretty lighthearted and have a good bit of humor in the the writing. I think that if it was super dry, it would be a bit harder to get people to pay attention yeah yeah there's definitely some moments where i just uh, <laughs> do like one of those chuckles where i'm next to uh, chantelle on the couch holding my switch and she's like what oh, i'm like oh yeah nothing just uh, some crazy shit jono wrote it's all right <laughs> just jono classic jono <laughs> yeah, well, classic jono what was it what was it like for you to play the game because i know like from talking to brendan um who was another person that like got the code a bit earlier to help with some of the play testing he he was telling me that there was like a lot of stuff he was reading and he's thinking like, Oh, it's classic Jono or like that's <laughs> stuff I've heard Jono say all the time, which I was surprised because I'm like, I'm not a fantasy character. I'm not a witch. I don't, I, I would <laughs> like to think that I don't talk like that, but I guess there's like expressions and, and phrases that slip through from uh, our everyday lexicon too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think there was anything where I'm like, Oh, that is something Jono says all the time, but there was, uh, there was there was a couple of references, uh, you know, to um, say sacred symbols, which I, I I saw in the initial trailer as well. But a character called Hob, who just like, introduces himself with uh, greetings and salutations, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I see, I see where he got that from. And, um, there's yeah. a lot of Easter eggs in there. Like there's um, there's a character called Bren. Like I just mentioned, Brendan. There's mm-hmm. a character called Bren who says he's extremely humbled which is obviously from the Hungry Gamers intro. And then mm-hmm. there's like a Stay Hungry in there as well. So I, I didn't see the Stay Hungry. It. I didn't see that one. Yeah, there's a, there's mm. a Stay Hungry. So yeah. look out for that. I would have definitely That's noticed true. that one if I saw that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I tried to slip in some uh, some stuff for... for, for it's, it's, it's a funny thing to slip in something that only like five or ten people might appreciate, but I get a kick out of that anyway. Yeah, well, tell you what, you're, you're the writer of the game. You can put what you want in there. You can put That's something... It. You put something everyone gets, and you can put something only ten people in the world will get. But that—that's what's um you know special about these types of games, where they are smaller projects and they can be more intimate to like a smaller group of people. Whether that's your friends or that's just a, a group of people that enjoy that certain genre, because we're yeah. certainly not getting this type of game from you know a triple A developer or anything. This is something that uh, which we are only getting in the indie space. I'm very thankful that we are because I'm a yeah. suck of these types of games, man. I love them. <laughs> that's great. That's great. But yeah, I think that's like even like calling on the spirit of Rainbite because in, in Reverie, I know that some of the NPCs had some dialogue that only Kiwis would get, like references mm. to TV commercials and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember that so one. It, I remember that yeah, one. Yeah, so it was... um. It was fun to do that and also just to have like the NPCs making like there's a arrow to the knee style <laughs> reference from one of the NPCs. So there's stuff there that everyone will hopefully get as well. Mm. Uh, you mentioned that they, uh, Rainbite already, the guys there already had the sort of the idea for the story, the idea for mm-hmm. the gameplay and everything. And you came in and you sort of molded that story into what it's become in the uh, um, now released game. Yeah. Um, did you... Did you find it uh, better doing it that way instead of coming in just thinking of the whole sort of concept yourself or was it good having yeah. some sort of blocks to, to build off and just um, build out that way? That was a relief to me. And I think the you know example I've used before is having like, you know, a connect the dots kind of thing. Like it, the picture's there and I'm just there to kind of join the dots and then add the shading and color it in and make it as detailed or as fun as I want. And I think that's as much as like creating your own story, there's something about that too. But to be able to come in and just be like, here's a great idea for a game. Okay, that's that's the first thing ticked off. And I just have to make it work. That's That was really cool in this instance. If the idea for the game wasn't great, <laughs> that would have been a lot harder. But uh, they had come up with this this concept and this world and a few of these characters that really made it quite easy for me to think, okay, what what do I want that to look like and how can I make that character stand out from the others and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, because it's, uh, 
it's a great concept to really stand out. Like the idea of playing as a witch with a gun. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know about you, but can you point to any other game where you're playing as a witch but shooting? I, there's, there's I can't. A, there's apparently really. a game called Bullet Witch, which <laughs> I, I, do. uh, I, yeah, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if it did well. I, it, I just noticed that like people comment about it in like the YouTube comments for the trailer and stuff like that. Uh, and there's a game coming out called Knights and Guns later this year, which is a 2D platformer um, with obviously knights who have guns. So it's in the same vein, I guess, as, as Trigger Witch being that fantasy meets guns. But yeah, mm. no, I'm with you. Um, outside of like Final Fantasy where you have mages and then you have people with swords that have guns attached to them or whatever, like it isn't really something that I can say I've, I've seen a whole lot of which i i gotta give it to rain by like the concept for this game and the the genre in itself i think that it, i can't think of anything like it like i can't think of a twin stick shooter that's not a roguelite or arcadey like rezo gun style mm. where you're progressing with a story and upgrading your equipment with these rpg elements in basically an open world where you can go f- to whichever dungeon you want. Like that's pretty, that's pretty r- rare and unique. Yeah. And like, I really, I really enjoyed that aspect of it too. Cause uh, in 2017, I was a big fan of Blossom Tales. Um, that came out the same year. The switch came out, came to the switch. Mm-hmm. And that was your more sort of, I guess your traditional type of Zelda open world game seems to link to the past, but sort of the spin on that was that the story was being told to you by your grandfather and that you're going out on this adventure. And then your grandfather can just be like, Oh no, this happened. And then that happens in the game and, and, <laughs> and it makes for some really ridiculous scenarios. Yeah. And similar in this as well, where, you know, it is feels very different. Obviously not having a sword, you've got like a multitude of guns to choose from each dungeon you go to, you're unlocking a new gun. You're able to upgrade them as you go along. And I I really enjoyed that because a lot of the time you're like looking at your health bar, you're like getting hearts to add to your health bar or something. That's typically what mm-hmm. you do in a Zelda game. That's your upgrades. Um, but in this, you know, you get a couple, you can upgrade your health, but you're mainly focusing on these guns. You're looking at the, how quickly you can recharge them. You're looking at how much damage they do, how much uh, shots per second you can do. And, I thought that was really good, and by the end of the game, I was uh, I was a fire firehouse. My um, <laughs> my character just <laughs> went through fire everything, lines. and I, yeah. I yeah, I I just love that as- aspect of it. If like if the gameplay feels really good, um, and I'm not just saying that because you're here, Jono, and uh, <laughs> hey, I had nothing to do with that's the, right. I, the I can, gameplay. <laughs> I can say, tell you what, Jono, the gameplay was rubbish, but um, you're the writer, so you get away with it. <laughs> uh, I'm with you. Like I'm a fan of the game as much as you, I think. And I had a great time playing and upgrading mm. my guns and deciding which ones and holding my upgrades till I, cause I knew there was a better gun coming or whatever it is. And I, I think that as I was playing, sometimes I'm like, ah, this isn't the gun for me. But then I know that there's someone else who's going to come along and be like, sweet shotguns. That's, that's me. I love, I always go with the shotgun. I always go with the flamethrower and that's where I think like you really get to pick your own style and approach to the combat. Cause mm. every gun that you, up, once you upgraded it, they're all amazing. Like yeah. <laughs> you just destroy dudes when, once you've, uh, once you've put some investment into those mm. firearms. Yeah. Even the very first game, uh, sorry, the gun, the, the hand cannon, when you fully upgrade that, like at the start, you're like, bang, 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 you know, it's like a pistol or whatever. But yeah. by the time, you reach the end of the game and you're fully upgraded. It's like a, it's like almost machine gun and it's so strong. And oh, I appreciate it very much because at yeah. the start of the game, I was like, Oh no, I'm, I'm out of ammo of my uh, machine gun. I forgot what the name was. Sorry, Johnny battle blaster, the battle blaster. Thank you. And I'm like, Oh, I'm back to back to my hand cannon. Ah, oh, bang, bang. Oh no, this feels nowhere near as good. But when you upgrade yeah. that, it's like, you know, do I have to swap? Yeah, I should because the other ones are fun too, but it's still, <laughs> it's still really useful. Yeah, absolutely. What was your favorite gun in the game? I think you can't go past the Battle Blaster. Like, oh, okay. th- there's other games that are more fun, but I think the Battle Blaster is just the most consistent. Like, it shoots straight, unlike the um, the Mini Blasters or the Uzis. And 
I, I like having heaps of ammo as well. So, you yeah. know, once you upgrade the ammo, it's just like, come at me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, just I'm I'm thinking about just like the flamethrower because I um th- there's there's a certain bit in the in the game when there's there's a lot of enemies coming at you, and that flamethrower was so useful just having that just swapping Crap straight to that, trial. yeah, and it just worked so well, and I was uh I was very thankful for that because I was very comfortable with the first three guns, and uh, when I started using the fl- flamethrower, that became a that might have even been my second favorite gun out of all of them, and I'm I'm not typical of, like, not typically a flamethrower user because it's like in a lot of games it's like, it's a bit yeah. slow. It's oh yeah, they're burning, they slowly die. Oh, okay, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not as uh, quick and action packed as the other guns, but no, I really did appreciate it in this game. Yep, mm. and I hope you appreciated the the sounds of the guns because I I worked on on mm. those too. Like I did the sound design for this game and had a lot of fun creating these creature dying sounds and the <laughs> gun reload noises and all that stuff. It was because, because I am a writer writing was like the natural thing. That was like an extension of other things that I've done before, but sound design was a new area. So I had so much fun, like pretending that I was, someone else and making all these cool sounds <laughs> yeah so i was gonna ask like did you get into the sound design because of your podcasting because you had maybe some of this gear around you had the microphone and whatever stuff to kind of do or yeah yeah i was talking about this on another podcast i did recently but i i loved in final fantasy 6 when kefka would show up as the villain and you hear that creepy laugh and i loved that kind of indication that the bad guy's here and I wanted that for the the main villain, the man in black. And there is a laugh that happens. But originally I was like messing around with noises and I said to Jared, like, oh, can we have this happen? And it just like slowly evolved where I was like, oh, I think I can fix, like I can make the sound for the hand cannon better. And I was watching like some sound design videos in Hollywood and there's this great YouTube channel that shows you how they do all the different sounds from like the movies you love. Other was a shotgun and I was like I like that I want the hand cannon to sound like real meaty and um, yeah so it was, it was cool to kind of flex that audio foley kind of uh, gene and, and get to work with you know you know the old like yeah. that's the, <laughs> the sound of like the, the the canister going on the the, the flamethrower or whatever it might be so yeah it was just so much fun to, to mess around with that kind of thing Yes. What what were some of your more uh, interesting methods of getting some of these sounds? So you just gave us the description of the bottle. <laughs> did you do, did you use your own voice for any of it, or did you put yeah. like your your armpit up to it and tickle your hairs, <laughs> or <laughs> all kinds of random stuff? Like the um, I, I used a lot of sounds from like sound libraries as well for stuff that I, I didn't have recordings of, whether it's like an earthquake sound or you know you're trying to do these magic noises when people cast spells and looking at how they make them in Harry Potter and trying to kind of emulate that. Mm. But, uh, the, the, yeah. So the, the man in black, when he talks, there's like that kind of, um, animal crossing kind of dialogue. Like the, the, exactly. Except a few octaves lower. Um, <laughs> <so> the, <laughs> the man, the man in black is, is me and the witches are all my wife. Oh. doing like a, a noise and we played around with that for ages trying to find the right thing where the, it was like i think in in animal crossing they recorded like each letter of the alphabet and then whatever word whatever letter the word starts with it makes that noise and plays it really quickly mm. but that didn't quite work for what we were trying to do and i think it just ended up being just the one sound for each line of dialogue and so so hannah was uh was the witches i was the man in black and the goblins and i think you can kind of hear it when you listen to the man in black he's like do 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 or something like that no actually that's the miners he's like what 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 um <laughs> so that that's good fun when you know that it's that it's us i think but the the 
the the best one of all is all the little imps that run around and you know there's an imp that casts spells there's an imp that heals other um enemies there's an imp that shoots like a sniper rifle like they're just everywhere in the game and they've all got the sound of my 18 month son oh crying yeah. basically <laughs> when you kill him <laughs> um except i recorded those noises when he was like six months old so just one day sitting in in my study here he was like on the ground just he wouldn't shut up so i was like all right well i'm just gonna hit record and i'm at least gonna use these noises for something <laughs> and uh when you kill the imps you can hear him crying <laughs> I could just imagine, like, you put him down, you're like, all right, mate, cry, please, I need these sounds. And then he's just, like, <laughs> perfectly asleep, just being on his best behavior. Yeah. Like, oh, he's just, like, poking him, please, please cry. <laughs> but yeah, no. You just got to gotta make use of, um, I mean, if you're going to have to sit here and listen to a baby cry and they're not going to stop, then you may as well make some um, sounds out of it. There's the, you know, the, there's, like, an enemy that, like, rolls. Mm-hmm. And he's, like, when he, before mm. he attacks, he's, like, Ugh! Yeah. And that's. That's that's my kid as well. <laughs> Just like down pitched like three octaves. <laughs> Those ones were always sort of in a in a group, and then you just hear like, oh crap, <laughs> do a dash, yeah. get out the way. <laughs> yeah, and I can't remember what I did, but I love the sounds of the onions, the little onion man dying. They're like, eh. <laughs> I think that was me. <laughs> yeah, and it works well when there's yeah. Once again, like there's a big horde of them, and you just like mowing them all down. <laughs> <Yes. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> just hear the little heads pop. It's mm. like a or something. <laughs> so did you like wrap these sound effects up like a fair bit before launch, before writing, or did you sort of finish both uh sides of the uh, development at similar times? It was it was kind of like I'd finished the writing mm-hmm. or ninety percent of it and then I just wanted to do something because I'm just that kind of person. So I was like, All right. let me do the sounds. Oh, so you didn't, yeah, <laughs> so, you didn't actually start doing it until you finished writing. Right? Yeah, I, I like, because I guess the way that it works is, you know, you do your draft and then that's so much easier to finish than making the rest of the game. So I probably mm-hmm. finished that halfway through last year. And between then and now, like even like a few days ago, I was still like getting into that document and updating little things and here and there that I noticed that bother me or whatever it might be. Or I'd throughout the process, they'd be like, Oh, we now have a, a cut scene where this happens. Can you like make that work? Or we've changed this location to this location. Okay. Well then I'll have to change like a bunch of dialogue. Mm. So there's the rewrites happening constantly, but the sound effects were like the back half of last year, pretty much. And up until the de- like I, I did most of them and then they'd say, oh, we created this new enemy so we need a sound for it dying. So I'd jump back on the computer and, and record some of that. <laughs> and right up until like the demo coming out, I noticed like the first boss that you fight in the tutorial area that does this like evil laugh when they attack. And I noticed that they were doing like the same laugh every single time they attacked and it was annoying me. I was like, it's too much of the same sound. So I went back and like, made a few different versions of it just so that it's not the same thing constantly so it's 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 cool seeing that you can still make these tweaks right up until launch pretty much Mm. yeah i as a gamer you might you might have been saying in the past you know what what's with these day one updates but now as on the team you're like (laughs) thank god (laughs) yes definitely yeah it's um it's it's a great thing to be able to patch a game i don't know how they got games shipped back when it was like that's it that's, mm. that's the game and that's done and you know we have all these classic games with bugs and game breaking bugs that just stay in there forever <laughs> yeah it'd be terrifying as a as a developer putting it years years of work out there and knowing that's it that's nothing you can yeah. do about it anymore i probably had to do like 20 times more qa and testing than what people do now mm. yeah just we've heard like this sounds like a lot of work Jono and this isn't your full time gig um, no it, the boys at <laughs> Rainbow this is their full time gig isn't it uh, Daniel, Tom and Jared is it their full time job yeah. as well yep sort of like it was for the majority of development each of them have now got 
proper jobs in game <laughs> development right. um, or in uh, programming because that's what they studied at, at university. So, um, so it's it's only really like Jared, especially in the last kind of month or two, has started working with Pickpock in Wellington, who do a lot of mobile games, and that means that I don't we don't really know what's going to happen in the future uh-huh. for Rainbite, but oh, for, no. the, for the for the ah for the vast majority of the development, yeah, like it was um it was their nine to five or their eight to four or however they wanted to do it because <laughs> yep. they're all, you know, working from home, remote. The pandemic didn't affect us mm. at all because because of that. And mm. uh, I, I think pretty much as soon as Reverie Sweet As Edition was released, this the Switch port, um, mm-hmm. they ported another game onto consoles that wasn't theirs. So it was um, someone else's game. They, they did that port. And I think pretty much since they finished that, they started working on um on trigger Witch. so it was it was like yeah a, a good two or three years of their life yeah definitely and i was actually pretty shocked when i um before the show i'm like when did reverie come out again and it, it for switch at least i know it came out early on playstation um consoles mm-hmm. but it came out um at the start of 2019 i'm like was, yeah, only, okay. was, it, was it only then it's only two years ago it feels like at least three but i don't know yeah it must have been 2018 on on playstation that yeah. makes sense. Because I remember I was I was like, you know, fingers crossed, ho- hoping for it to come to Switch um, after Vita and that. But I guess uh, talking about Vita, Jono, this, mm. uh, you and the Rainbite team, very, very big fans of trophies, platinum trophies, all of that. And yep. when I was playing this game on Switch, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I try to separate myself from platinums and stuff because cause yeah. I, I love them. I find them a lot of fun, but my OCD gets the better of me and I just got to just sort of put it away so when i play on switch it's like it's a little bit of fresh air but i noticed even on switch the achievement system is actually built into the game so when you pop an achievement actually pops up um like it would and it like a trophy or an achievement and uh, i dare say on the other platforms it will pop up at the same time you get that said trophy or whatever but i thought it was really neat to actually include it in the switch version too because even though it's not um, you know, helping me achieve the the platinum trophy, and it's going to go to all my friends, and everyone's going to give me a big applause when I get it. And I'm like, well, thank you, everyone. I have the platinum trophy in Trigger Witch. I am supreme. Um, it is nice just to like track these things down because there are achievements for you know going through the story, getting all the collectibles, mm-hmm. upgrading the guns, you know, all the typical things that just help you, uh, you know, flesh the game out and uh, achieve the hundred uh, percent completion. I felt that was really nice to include in the actual game itself. Yeah, they did that in Reverie as well. I'm mm. pretty sure. Um, yeah, they which did. It's it's cool, and and it's it's something that I've noticed. Not that I play like a ton of Switch games, but I've noticed that some of those third party titles do build that in because they, like, it, like uh, Cuphead, I think, is a good example. Like, yeah. there's an in game achievement thing for that. You can even get uh, achievements, <laughs> like Xbox achievements, with your Xbox account yeah. on there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Uh, crazy, but um, yeah, it, it, it's like we've they've already done like the work of creating the trophies or achievements on the other platforms, so you may as well just you know mm. bring them into the switch in that way. The only dif- difference is that you get like a notification on the bottom of the screen, while on you know PlayStation and Xbox you get the typical notification, uh, but you do have like that menu you can open up, and even on on PlayStation you can see what you've got and what you haven't got unlocked and mm. the little artwork for each one, which is cool. And yeah, it's a, it's a great way to, for, I think for Nintendo fans to hit that hundred percent mark of a game. And the hundred percent completion rate is directly tied to how many trophies you've unlocked. Hmm. Yeah. Did you have any sort of role writing the achievements in the game or was that up I, to one of I the other guys? I wrote most of them to yep. be honest. I, um, like I love trophies, as you know, and mm-hmm. I love cool trophies and trophies that have cool names. So yeah. it was really fun trying to come up with like puns or references to movies and stuff like that. For example, like there's an arena in this game where you can go and fight and get like a high score. So I wanted to have like a gladiator reference in there and there's like a Sabrina the Teenage Witch reference in there. And there's just, 
yeah a lot of a lot of good fun working working those in and like it's not something that i thought people would really care about but i had someone like at me on twitter today who i don't even know and they're like did you write the trophies for this game and i was like yep and they're like i chuckled at a, at a couple already <laughs> and that was that was cool like yeah <laughs> to, to think that people care about it as much as i do uh pretty fun and there's so many trophies in the game there's like 58 trophies of 60 trophies or something which i don't know if there's any games with more than that there probably is but um it's if you get that little like adrenaline kick or what is it like uh what's the 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 the, uh chemical in your brain that makes the the dopamine hit yeah yeah yeah. if you get that (laughs) dopamine when the the notification hits you're gonna have a great time playing trigger witch because like the first hour of the game especially it's like ding 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 (laughs) yeah i've uh, i've pre-ordered my physical copy on playstation 5 so i'm gonna be sitting there in the chair going oh yeah that's just the good stuff. <laughs> just, oh, just give me those trophies. <laughs> yeah, because I see a, a friend of friend of the show as well, Paul James. He's going to uh, get the the digital edition and the physical edition on PlayStation just so he can get double, double plat- yeah, yeah, double platinum. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. It it gives people who buy that digital version a good reason to go back. I think because as much as I had fun, I'm really curious what that PlayStation Five, like what that Dual Sense feedback is going to be like and how they can work that in there with the uh, you know all the different guns and how they're going to make that feel so yeah all right. they're actually putting work the, to do on that. they're actually putting those features in the game are they yeah yeah wow. definitely i know jared's definitely keen to do that and see how much he can figure out it's it's one of those things where i always wonder like does playstation help you like you know we've all played astros playroom with the little raindrops and everything and is that something that you can get the code for from playstation to to incorporate that or is it linked to the audio because you know obviously you can get audio playing through the controller which Mm. the reload sounds and everything happen that way already on the ps4 so i think that yeah i think jared was saying there's a way that like the level of audio corresponds with like the level of shake or shock or whatever rumble <laughs> depending on what console you have yeah right that's another thing i learned is like the the certification process they're really um picky about different uh terminologies in the different versions so the the w- what you call rumble on one console has to be called like mm. shake on another console and has to be called something else on the other one hmm. yeah i wonder I didn't really notice anything to do with the HD rumble. I think that's um, on, on Switch. I don't think that's probably as noticeable. I was just playing in handheld mode for most of the time and I was actually playing with a, a third-party controller as well. So that wouldn't have, made, <laughs> wouldn't have had it. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's cool that um, the PS5 version is actually going to have some of that functionality. I, w- I would have never mm. thought they would have worried about it for um, you know uh, this type of game, but it'd be pretty cool yeah. just to have that feedback. Yeah, I think that if you're going to release a game with on the PS5, you may as well make the most of the features. I think that's the way that mm. at least Jared's thinking about it as like the main programmer. It's probably up to him partly, but I think the other guys all have that uh, skill base to fall back on if they want to jump in and help with it too. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but they've got a few months because I think those physicals don't release until Q4 or something. Yeah, I think it was late in the year, so... yeah. Got a little bit of time if you want to mm. get that. Um, they'll probably be all sold out by the time this goes up, but there are physical editions for the Switch as well if you're interested in picking yep. up a copy. If you're one of those Definitely. hardcore collectors. True. I just realized I've been talking a lot about PlayStation and this is a Nintendo podcast, so sorry. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, man. It's on all the platforms. Someone might listen yeah. to this and want to uh, get it on Xbox and play it on their iPad through xCloud. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? No judgments, hey? No, no judgments here. As long as you don't get it on PC, don't do it there. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> not possible. If you get it on PC, it means that you're a pirate or something. <laughs> Emulating it. Yeah. 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 Well, what was the decision not to uh, release it on PC? That's. It seems like, you know, all mm. sort of indie games come to the PC just because that's an easy place to, to get it via Steam or Epic Game Store. What was the yeah, decision think- there? I'm not 100% sure because I don't speak on behalf of Rainbite, but I think mm-hmm. that it's mostly to do with the fact that it's a twin stick shooter mm. and 
it might be, uh, I'm just going to make this up now, but I'm <laughs> guessing that there might be issues with having a game that's only compatible with a controller being released. Gotcha. In, yep. is, is that a thing? I don't know much about Steam, but I'm wondering if it's like, if you release on Steam, it has to be playable on a keyboard or it's like a condition of being able to be on there. Yeah, but it'd be pretty easy Mate. with the, the, the WASD on the uh, cable for Was the mouse as a twin as a twin stick i don't know i think that i think maybe it's possible but they weren't willing to it's a lot of work test to, it yeah. and get it figure it out like you, you could do it with a mouse I'm, I'm sure that would work i'm sure there's other twin stick shooters on pc but i think yeah they just wanted to probably just wanted to get it right for these three platforms and worry about that later so stay tuned for a pc release i'm sure it won't be too far away steam box baby yeah, the Steam Deck. Steam Deck, whatever it's called. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's a Steam Box. That was like six years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the what were they? The Steam Steam Machines they were, they were yeah. bringing out. And I, I don't get the idea of them. They are just like, they're Steam Machines. All it was was pre-made, pre-built PCs. That's all they were. That you can only play games on. That you can only play games on, yeah. It's like, well, I don't know. I don't know the point in that. But yeah, I'm actually pretty keen for the Steam Deck. But regardless, you can't play... Trigger Witch on it, so not yet, not yet, but maybe by then. Yeah, yeah. By the time we get it, it'll be twenty twenty six or something. <laughs> God knows. Yeah. You got to play Trigger Witch two by then. Mm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you mentioned before that, uh, like you know, the guys they've you know they've gotten sort of their um, some other jobs as well. Has work on something else from Rainbite started yet, or? No, no details, no um, details. You haven't released this game, Thomas. <laughs> saying this, so, I, but yeah, are there no, plans? Definitely, definitely hasn't started yet because we're still like patching <laughs> yeah, of course. this one. And I, I say we, but it's like Jared's still patching this one. And then once that's done, its direct attention will go into the next patch, <laughs> and then mm. the d- attention will go into the PS5 update and potentially a Steam or PC version beyond that we've definitely chatted about ideas for another game that we could work on but that was also a long time ago i don't know if you know it's it's i think it's totally up to how well trigger witch does because these guys all work for game studios or tech companies Mm. there's so there's probably some clause that they have about beginning work on a new video game that could be in competition so it's 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 not something where there's any um there's no guarantee i'll say that much mm. and mm. i hope that i hope that trigger which is successful enough that they can you know fall back on on rainbite and and keep it going or in some way shape or form whether it's you know the three of them or whether it's two of them or one of them like whatever it looks like i, I think rainbite has built a pretty good reputation and would be cool to see them stick around whether it's you know maybe maybe it's not for some time but it, it would be cool i definitely like, i definitely want to keep working with them and definitely want to keep making games with anyone that'll have me so <laughs> yeah yeah right. for my sake i hope they stick around <laughs> yeah so like if, if they don't stick around will you say hey guys i'm up for freelance i'd love to do some writing would that be something you would do yeah, I'm already in that position now, mm. basically. Like, I'm just a contractor the same way that, you know, a compo- the composer for this game was a contractor and um, the composer for, I'm guessing, any game is probably mm. just someone that they've brought in to, to do the sound. A John Williams type. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, he's a contractor. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking... And you know, I've talked to a couple people we know who, who make games and the possibility of working with them in the future, which is cool and exciting, but games take so long that, you know, it'd be, it'd be good to have a few of these, uh, you know, seeds in the turf, in the soil, so to speak, a few uh, pies in the oven. And um, I definitely am going to be putting myself out there to, to work on in games, whether it's writing a story, editing a script, writing tutorials or law or menus or collectibles, descriptions, like anything, because it's just such a fun 
and and cool collaboration to be part of like it really is the that amalgamation of art and sound and music and interaction and immersion that's so fun to to be just one of the cogs in that machine and to to think about how does how does my writing affect the gameplay and how can the gameplay impact what I'm writing and how can those things work together and how can they make each other better that's what's really fun to work on that compared to just like writing a book or whatever else people might do yeah no when you first mentioned that you were uh, going to be writing this game I can't remember when you made the announcement I don't know if it was close to the announcement of the game itself or not feels like forever ago but I don't know if it was mm. that long ago forever he only came out two years ago <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm so happy that you're able to do this, John. It's really cool to see you uh, tackle some of these projects with you. Thanks, you know, you put in so much work into putting in work. No, no pun there, but just with. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wear mine today, but it's actually no, in the in, right. the in That's the laundry. Close <laughs> yeah, so I got an eight bit shirt on. So, um, yes, seeing seeing you put like at those episodes every week. Uh, publishing two books and now being the writer of the game. It's just phenomenal what you're doing. You should be very proud of yourself. I'm sure you are. And right, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, just a total inspiration, Jono. So. Oh, thanks, man. Same to you. Like, I, I love that you guys are... How, what episode are you up to now? Like, a million? Uh, 300? A, 200? We, we, rec- we recorded last night episode 198. So... Yeah, wow. By the time this so goes up, be, we'll be 200. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Like, you've... You've you've gone far and well and far beyond the putting in work as far as like numbered episodes. So that's that's awesome to see you guys stick at the the weekly routine and just smash it and build a following over the years. So likewise back at you and appreciate you having me here to, to chat about it because you know th- throughout the process of knowing that this was coming a switch, I've been looking forward to to chatting to you about it to be honest because I knew that <laughs> you know. I, I knew that you'd enjoy it and I knew that your listeners would listen to you. So when you tell them to go and play it, I'm sure they will. Yeah. And especially after this uh, discussion, guys, apparently Reverie, um, not Reverie, apparently Rainbite might potentially not be making another game. So make sure this sells very well. Go and buy it for the love of God. Go and buy it two times. I don't know, three times. Yeah. <laughs> make it the next Make it the next Among Us and then they'll have no mm. choice but to uh, to make more. No, don't make it the next Among Us because then it'll be like two years later. Oh, look, it's successful Correct. now. Too late. Yeah. Too late. <laughs> make it the next Goose game. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That'd be, that'd be good. Uh, I still remember on um, was it a current affair or something where it's like, oh, look, these guys became millionaires overnight. So, yeah, they just made Untitled Goose Game overnight. In one day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, just overnight success. I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course it was. Game development's easy. Easy peasy, isn't it, Jono? Now that you've, mm, um, absolutely. Being closer I mean, to I guess their, their bank account overnight was a, a success. But, um, mm. yeah, the, the work to get there, it's crazy how long these things take. Like, we thought originally that this game would come out last year and we're almost in August at this point. So, it's, um, you know, if you want to make something good, it's going to take a lot longer than you think. And that can be said for anything, I reckon. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I could just imagine with the game and all the writing, all the all the QA, even like um with the early copy I got, um I just like mentioned a couple of things that mm. you know I saw for for the patches and stuff, and you know it was just like only little tiny small things, but um Jared he was already onto it, so he knows what he's doing. It's yeah. all, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. So Trigger Witch on Nintendo eShop, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live. It's twenty two dollars and fifty cents in Australia. Ooh. I think that, let's assume it's $15 US. Yeah, I think that sounds about That sounds right, kind of right. Heard. Yeah. So, Jono, apart from that, where they can find the game and all of that, uh, mm. where can they find you, Jono? You can find me uh, reading everything about Trigger Witch on Twitter, at Jono himself, and watching all the, uh, the YouTube videos as well. So, if you skip the dialogue... Or you turn the sound effects down to zero, even though the music in this game is fantastic. We didn't even get to talk about that. Uh, I, I will find you, and I mm. will, I will shame you. But, yeah, uh, especially yeah. especially this audience on Switch, uh, we can be very very uh, guilty of turning the sound down and watching mm. TV while playing it in handheld mode. So yeah, or podcasts. Yeah, so even if it's this podcast, don't listen to it. 
when you're playing too. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's just like someone is playing Trigger Witch right now, and they're just sweating, sweating gallons, <laughs> gallons. Oh no! What have I done? I've upset Jono. Yeah. yeah, and no. Drew, you've upset Drew too. Don't forget. Mm, yeah, no, I'm very upset. <laughs> I'm devastated. Well, we're going to be back talking uh, spoilers soon, aren't we? We are. So, so if, if people listen to this and then play the game, that's perfect. Like, come back next week and. There it is. You can hear all about it. Hear all about it um, while you're playing the new game plus mode. Hmm. Mm. That's the thing. All right, guys. Until next time, the doors to the House of Mario are closed. I'll catch you later. <laughs>